start and hello. So this is our next lab exercise. And uh, the idea with this lab exercise is to look deeper into analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. And uh, the instructions and the code is on Studium. I printed out the instructions here as well to have as a guide for me. Um, but since now you can get the boxes, I will really start from scratch by putting everything together from scratch. Start with a simple blinky script. I will do this in platform IO today. I decided and uh, just show you the steps um, from actually putting everything together. So we have the microcontroller, we put it towards the edge of the breadboard, perhaps one pin in, doesn't really matter, and it snaps into place, sits there. And now we can already connect the USB cable and you will see that there will be some uh, numbers running up here. This is because there's already code in this microcontroller from my experiments yesterday evening when I adapted this um, today's lab to, uh, yeah, to the new microcontroller which we have here. So if we want to connect an LED and we are supposed to do to in, in this lab instructions as well later on, um, we'll need a resistor. You have two values of resistors in your box. I will put up the color code as well on Studium. Um, and uh, both of them would actually work with a one kilo ohm resistor. It would be a bit dim. So we'll take the resistor and we put it onto the breadboard like this. We take an LED and uh, I know that this red LED works. I don't know anything about this green LED. So let's start with this green LED and we'll connect it I connect it to the blue rail with a shorter leg and the longer leg goes to the resistor. Then I will also connect this blue rail to ground from the microcontroller. And I need to finally put a wire from any digital I.O. port and I take D0 to the LED. And uh, now the LED is wired up. It's not lit up. Um, we can just briefly test the LED by connecting um, this to plus three volts, which I do have down here. And yes, the LED would work. Um, so this means that there's not five volt or three volt, sorry, three volt on the IO pin yet. So we'll have to start and write some code. And for this, I go over to the laptop. And as I said, I will try to do it in platform IO today. So I start a new project and wait for it to find the installed boards here. You still see the numbers. Control to the numbers ticking away over here behind my or in front of my hand. Um, it's still, what is it doing? It was so much faster yesterday and I don't have time to restart the computer. It has to come up with a list of boards here. Otherwise I cannot actually start doing anything. So perhaps I have to restart visual code simply. I give it a try. I restart visual code. And if that doesn't help, I will revert back to Atmel Studio. Because we don't have infinite time. Okay. I don't have a shortcut for that yet. So Visual Studio, okay, no, don't have to hide, it's already gone here. So, ta-da. Downloading C, C++ language components. Why is it doing that again? Installing, installing. 
actually I got a, a, a message yesterday that there was a new version um, available. Of course, I didn't want to update. I still have. It, it, so what did it do? It installed an update and still tells me there's another update. I've I've no idea. Um, we go to platform IO. Platform IO home. Home. Okay, loading, 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 loading. Okay, okay. Let's see recent news I got. And here we are. Okay, now now it was a bit quicker or much quicker. Um, select one of 914 available boards. I will first give it a name. 2020-11-18 lab is the name of my project. And when selecting a board here, I will look for the um, Pro Micro. And we have the Spark Fun, Pro, Spark Fun Pro Micro in two versions. We have the one which is closest. Yes, Stasia, it is based on last class. So it is actually about the analog IO and PWM. So I will actually be explicit and explain stuff which is lost where the audio is lost forever um, <laughs> in the um, last video. Um, so Pro Micro 3.3 volts, 8 megahertz and we have only the Arduino framework available. We will just in a second remove that completely. I say finish tells me I have to wait, I have to wait, please wait, please wait, please be patient, please wait, please wait. And here something is happening and I will not interfere while it's trying to do things. It tells me down here in the status bar that it's doing things. Checking core installation, index rebuild. loading we got this nice bug again okay i will expand the list of our project here to the left and uh, so right now we have a platform io file which i will open first and here in the last row it says framework arduino i will remove this line and I will go to source and here we have a file automatically created which is called main.cppp cpp and I will also delete this file move to recycle bin instead I will create a new file right click new file new file click which I will call main.c I have not figured out, I tried to compile a CPP file here. I have not figured out why it didn't work. Um, so, and now we have a, an editor here for our C file. And uh, to just get the LED blink, what do we have to do? Actually, our platform IO compiler already knows that our board is running at 8 megahertz. Um, so I will comment out our very first line of code, which normally is define fcpu as 8 megahertz. But we will have to manual write the include for the avr slash io.h file. And uh, then I will also include our standard delay library, um, include, it's in util, util, utilities, and it's called delay.h. And now we also have to completely from scratch start our, write our code for our infinite loop. That would be an int main void first with a pair of parentheses and then an infinite while and what I like about platform IO is that I after just typing 
two characters, I can press enter and I get the complete uh, structure of an, a while loop while condition one. And now what do we want to do? We want to blink an LED which is connected to pin D zero. So on port D pin zero. For that we have to actually switch this pin as an output and we do this with a data direction register ddrd and uh, we will have to set the least significant bit to a one which means it will be an output and then we we'll have to write something into this bit for this we use the port register where we write a 0B0000001 in order to switch the LED on. Then we put in a delay in milliseconds and we let it blink for 200 milliseconds. Then we switch it off by actually port D. There's a lot of options to choose from in the autocorrect. We put a zero there, um, which would mean that the LED is off. Let me put a comment here. Let off. And in order to actually see that everything works, we wait a different time. Let's say we wait a second in the off state before we finish the infinite loop. And now it should run around like this yeah, essentially forever. Down here, the check mark is the compile button and or the build button. So I try to click it. Um, I clicked it and uh, we get some output from the compiler here. And it says everything was went fine and we created 246 bytes of code. I know this is a very small text down here. I was able to increase the font size here, but I wasn't able to increase the font size here. Um, at least we now should have a code file. And where where is it? And I uh, found out that you can actually find where your project is quite easily by right clicking on any file in the list here in the workspace list and choose reveal file in Explorer. And then on Windows, I get an Explorer window like this. Um, I don't know how this looks on a Mac or I haven't, and I haven't tried it on, on Linux yet. Where our code is then is in the subdirectory .pio here. In order to get in our, in, into our microcontroller, I will use Avia Dudes today and now I will copy the path to our project into the clipboard. I go to Avia Dudes and I try to find our project by actually copying it here. And we have .pio build spark fun. Here we have the firmware.hex file. This is the code which we want to program. And uh, now I should be able to actually double click on our microcontroller board and you should hear the pling pling sound. And then I should be able to choose a COM port here. It's actually COM9 today. <laughs> Yesterday was COM8. And uh, now it went back from the bootloader mode. Uh, so I have to double click it again to put it back into bootloader mode. And now I can actually program the code. And if we look what we have here now, it is a blinking LED, which is on for a shorter time. It is very blurry. It, 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 it should be very blurry. Um, it should, it could be blurry. It depends on your bandwidth and on how much zoom is compressing the images on your side. Um, by sharing the screen, I could actually give you a better quality on the source code, but I wouldn't be able to switch over to a bit between the cameras. I wouldn't be able 
to put up this window here so it's a compromise um, but uh, I stream to zoom in 1080p and uh, so this is less the recording is uh, the same quality hopefully as usual unless something has happened there um, but uh, yes there is a compromise in zoom here and I checked already in zoom I have the high quality camera setting so this is what I can offer you um, for today it is blurry especially the small fonts I'm completely aware of that that's why I try to have as big fonts as possible um, but we are somewhat limited here and also keep in mind that uh, yeah the the idea with these labs was that the students in, in previous year would do all this on by by themselves just based on the instructions and me and the lab assistant would be around to help out um, so having these recordings is an extra luxury for for us now um, <laughs> if there's something positive uh, on the whole corona thing it's perhaps this it's it's that i have to, i i have to do this all my own that's that's nice um but i also would like you to be able to do this and 13 of you already have the boxes and uh one yeah i i i saw the huge amount of emails which i got um, I wasn't aware that there's so many of you who um, expected to be sent to you. I have to, I didn't, I only saw the, the titles of the emails. I haven't looked into them yet. I didn't have any time yet. Um, okay, so we have our first blinking code and uh, this is nothing new. And this is just what we, just to show you again, now that you have the boxes, how you connect uh, an LED to a pin and get it blink. But what we want to do now is to actually look at PWM, Pulse Width Modulation, and uh, how we can use this to not only have an LED on and off, but actually dim an LED. And in order to do so, we have prefabricated code available on Studium. So if you go to the files I put up. So this is essentially file 00 here, what I did now. And uh, now we'll have a look at uh, file 01, code 01.c. Uh, good morning, Studium. Okay, this is far too slow for me. Okay. Um, and what I will do now is I just copy this, Control C, go back to Platform I.O., mark everything. I said I mark everything and I paste. And I got everything in a single row. Thank you. Um, this is not what I, absolutely not what I wanted. Um, so uh, because I don't want to reformat everything, I will revert to the files on my computer instead. Um, so here I have the original files before I uploaded them. So I take this one here, I open it in Programmer's Notepad. Is there anything happening? Yes. Control A, Control C. And I go here, control V. So this much looks much nicer. So good luck. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't copy from uh, Studium. You will up, mess up your code. Um, open the file, download the file from Studium instead. Um, so what this file does, let us first look into it. I have a init function here which does a hardware initialization and mostly in order to make PWM possible uh, we will need to program a timer and we will be working with timer zero and uh, you see all these I don't know if you see them but they are underscores where we don't yet know what to fill in we'll have to find this from the datasheet 
And uh, then I also, because I actually have some output here to the USB serial port, which is running in the background, we will also need to fetch the three files, which are mgeneral, mUSB.h and mUSB.c. And uh, these are also available on Studium. And what I will do is I go to, we, we include, include this as a library. And here actually the way to do it is different between platform IO or if you're compiling uh, from a command line in C, those of you who do the, uh, in, in, in Linux, um, those of you who compile from the command line, I assume I don't have to tell you how to include a library in your make file. Um, and in Atmel Studio, it's also a little bit different uh, because we would, com we would copy these files just into the source directory. You could do this here as well, but actually Platform IO opens a, or has a sub catalog here, which is called lib. This is where the libraries is, are, are supposed to be going. And uh, so if we go here and open this one in Explorer, it's here. I make a subdirectory, a new folder which I call MUSB, and into this folder I will copy the three files which are also on Studium, which are the they are they may be on Studium. They are not in this directory of my computer. Um, so I'll have to find them uh, here, no, probably I can find the, yes, I can find them here. Uh, this is uh, yesterday's project. So the three files musb.h, musb.c and mgeneral.h. We need these three files, we copy them and we paste them into our newly made directory MUSB here. And if we go back to Platform IO, they are here. So they show up directly in Platform IO as included libraries. And we can actually include them in these bracket parentheses um, in, and uh, then actually it should work. Um, so what does the rest of the code do? Um, it will actually in the endless loop here increment value, which is an 8-bit variable. And it will store this value in the register OCR0A, which is the output compare register A for timer 0. And just to remind you what this output compare register does, um, if we have the timer value, so the T, C and T value of our timer, then with time it will step it up from 0 to 255 because it's an 8-bit timer. And at 255 it will roll over and start again from 0. The OCR register now gives us a compare value, the output compare register. And every time we are passing this value, something can be happening. And what we want to happen here is actually we want to switch off an output pin because then if we have a lower OCR value, our output pin would switch off earlier. And if we had a larger value for the OCR, uh, then our output pin would switch off later. And so we can control the lengths of our output signal, our output pulses. So in order to do this, we'll have to have a look into the data sheet and the You'll have the complete data sheet on Studium, but uh, in the lab instructions, I just included the um, timer zero register for now. 
and here we can have a look and what we want to have to or what we have to fill into the blanks which we see here so i'll transition back here and you see that i left blanks for the com 0 a1 and com 0 a0 bit and for the wgm bits and for the cs bits so let's see what the data sheet tells us about the COM0A1 and COM0A0 bit. It says it is a compare match output mode. And uh, then we have four different tables. I think it's four tables. No, it's three tables. Um, in non-PWM mode, these two bits have a meaning. In fast PWM mode, this bits, uh, these bits have a meaning. And in phase correct PWM mode, this these bits have a meaning. We are here. We want to have fast PWM. It's also commented in the source code that we want that. And uh, so then we have normal port operation, OC output compare disconnected. Not what we want. Um, but what we actually want is one of the two last lines to clear on a compare match or to set on a compare match. And now let's watch my sketch here again. Um, we see that we want to clear the bit on the compare match. So what we want to do is we want to clear the bits on the compare match and set the bits once our timer reaches the top value. So this means COM0A1 should become A1 and COM0A0 should become a zero. So going back to the code, we want to have a one at this position and a zero at this position. Now we want to look up what mode our timer is supposed to be running in. So we go a couple of pages on and uh, here we have the waveform generating mode bits and uh, here we have normal, phase correct, CTC, fast PWM. That sounds like something which we want to have. So this is what we want to do. It's mode number three, which is also um, uh, it is also shown here in the code. Um, I've wrote that we want to have mode fast P PWM, and uh, I will answer the question in the chat in a in, in a second or in a while. Um, so this is what we want to set there. We want to have a zero one one on these WGM bits. Where are they? They are here. We want to have a zero on the highest and then we want to have a one and a one. And finally we have the CS bits which are in register TCCR0B. So what does the data sheet tell us about that register? We go a bit forward and get to the page describing TCCR0B, where we have the bits CS02, 01 and 00. And the bits themselves are described in a table on the next page here. Um, if they are all zero, our timer is not running, it's stopped. And then we have the different values which we can have for different clock prescalers which means that our eight megahertz from the CPU clock are first divided by nothing or by one <laughs> rather, um, divided by eight, by 64, 256 or 1024. Um, the code comments say that we are running at uh, divided by one. So we want to have zero, zero, one in these bits. And let's do this. We want to have zero, zero, one in the clock prescalers. And uh, then uh, we also set the bits or the, the, 
these DDR bits, so the, some port pits as bits as output. And why are we doing this? Well, now we are looking at the first page of uh, the lab instructions. And there we see, it's hard for me to highlight this, but the output pin, which is controlled by the PWM control unit of timer zero, it's actually this pin here. And this pin is the ninth pin on our microcontroller and it is equivalent to PB7, so the seventh bit of port B. And, and, uh, and you didn't see that, me showing this up here. So we are talking about this pin here and this pin here, which is the same pin. So in order for us to get the PWM signals out, we have to put this pin into output mode. And this I do here. And then I also do something to the PD0, which is kept as an output pin. But uh, this is actually, yeah, I, I blink it once here in the beginning, but that doesn't really matter for us now. What matters for us is that we take our circuit board here and that we now connect our LED not longer to uh, PD0 but to the output port pin of our PWM generator now which is B7 on this side of the microcontroller. Currently there's nothing here because we are not generating any PWM signals. And now I go back here and I compile the code and hopefully it will work. It complains about uh, that I redefined the 8 megahertz here. You saw this, um, these yellow warnings here. Um, this is because, uh, yeah, you need to have this line if you're running on Atmel Studio. But if you are compiling the code here, then this is already done in the background for us. But redefining it to the same value doesn't, have, doesn't give us any problem or headache. So now we have 2,994 bytes of code, which is a full 10% of our total code memory, which we uh, take up with this code. And uh, I put our chip into programming mode, program the code. And as soon as the code is uploaded and running, we should see something happening on the output from the USB. Um, because you see that we have inside the loop a sprintf here, which outputs the value um, which we have just written into the output compare register. As you see, it's not a very nicely formatted output because it actually runs all over the place. And this is because um, there is no line break included. And uh, so what we'll have to do here in order to get us a nicer display, we have to use line break characters slash r slash n and uh, then just recompile our code once more. So there, there was a question, where in the background is FCPU defined? Yeah, don't ask me. It's there, it's in the uh, platform ini file here is somewhere. I haven't dug into the details of uh, how platform IO works down to the least bit. Um, I'm, I'm just a newbie to this. Um, but I find it has some very convincing properties, this platform I.O. So um, I'm starting pretty much to like it. Uh, actually, now I, I switch to speaker view and zo in, in Zoom. I mean, from, for, on my screen, actually, it is a bit blurry, but it's, it's completely legible. I hope it is on your side as well. Um, so what, what we can see here, I, I will put up the Terra term terminal window um, here as well. So you see that uh, 
this up here in the corner is just a copy of what's happening in this window here. So this is numbers sent back by our microcontroller to our computer. And it is the value which we are writing into the output compare register. But what is happening on the other side now? What, what is happening um, with our circuit board? And if you now look at the LED here, you will see that it gets brighter and brighter um, as the numbers increase here. And this is because both our eyes and our camera sees a longer pulse as more light hitting us and so we can actually use this to actually dim an LED from completely off to completely on. And uh, the interesting thing which I can show you now but which most of you will not be able to reproduce is that I can try to show these pulses on the oscilloscope as well. Um, of course, I didn't prepare Ninja on my phone, but well, we will have to figure out something here in a second. So I connect the oscilloscope probe to the breadboard. And I now will have to move uh, this camera here from where it is now to, so that you actually can see the oscilloscope um, image. I will try to set up my phone. If, do we need the oscilloscope after this? No, we don't need the oscilloscope after this. Um, in order for you to not get seasick right now, I will actually do this while I switch over to this view um, and try to get the camera to film the oscilloscope. Why did you need to change the terminal window? In the previous tab, it froze. Um, because I'm I actually, instead of putty, I found out that Terra term on Windows is giving me a, a auto, auto start on the window. I will describe this once I find some time uh, on Studium as well. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I found it out by accident. I had this program installed previously I never tried it and uh, then I thought I'll try it. But now let's look, have a look at what we see on the oscilloscopes. So these are actually the pulses which our PWM unit generates. And uh, you see the numbers, the corresponding numbers um, right next to it. So you can see how as the value increases, the pulses get longer and longer, take up more time. The so-called duty cycle gets higher, which then in, in conjunction with our LED gives us a brighter LED. Um, I have a lot of noise here on my oscilloscope, which I don't really know where it comes from. Um, the whole setup shouldn't be that noisy, but uh, well, it doesn't matter. So we have we have the one level here, which is actually at 3.3 volts, zero level here. And up here, it tells us that we have 20 microseconds per centimeter or per grating division on the oscilloscope. So it's 20 microseconds from here to here. And the oscilloscope also tells us that currently we are producing a pulse free. No, it doesn't tell us because it's a cursor frequency and not a real uh, frequency. So I'll have to actually try to uh, adjust the cursor if I only knew. Ah, okay. So I'll. I, I leave this cursor here on this position and I move the other cursor to the start of the next pulse. And we see that we have a 1 over delta x here, which is 30.6 kilohertz. We actually calculated uh, last time already that this is actually, um, if we would read it off or could read it off a bit more accurately, it would be 32 
31,150, I think it was, or 31,250, 31,250 um, hertz. So by actually uh, changing the time scale, uh, I should be able to time this a bit more accurate now. We are at 31 point something kilohertz um, at a higher resolution here. Um, but this is how PWM works. So we can actually output a pulse. <clears throat> and uh, what the lab instruction now also include is that we should try to, but uh, since you don't have an oscilloscope at home, most of you, I didn't include it into our lab instructions here, but we should be able to actually get out an analog value of this by passing it through a low pass filter and i will just rig this up here on the breadboard for you give me a resistor and then we have a break one kilo one kilo is one kilo ohm good i don't know let's see Let's see. Let's have a look with the other oscilloscope probe. Oh, grab it. Yes, and we have to ground the other side of the capacitor. And I'll switch on the green line. And since I'm looking on on a weird angle this capacitor wasn't good enough i need a bigger one 100 picofarads is smaller not bigger 0.22 this is five times larger capacitor <clears throat> and now let me bring this curve up so that they are on the same vertical scale which they are not um, now they are on the same vertical scale and uh, yeah please ignore the noise on the oscilloscope it shouldn't be this noisy um, but you can see how the <laughs> how the greener line is actually moving up um, in comparison to the to the um, yellow line and this is actually the output after a low pass filter and you can see that this is a time average you can actually see slightly how it goes up during the pulse and then goes down after the pulse um, why doesn't the value change? It changes all the time, isn't it? So it actually, the average value goes up. It increases when the pulses get longer, the green line is actually moving up. And uh, now I will, before the break, uh, just switch over here again and show you what I did. The delta x value doesn't go up because the uh, I didn't change the timing. I, I just changed that I connected the, so it didn't affect the timing, I only affected the vertical axis, the voltage. So this is our filter circuit now with a resistor of one kilo ohm and a capacitor of 220 nanofarads. And it does a low pass filtering of the pulses which come through the white wire here. The green wire goes to the yellow channel of the oscilloscope and this is the green channel of the, of the oscilloscope. I don't like the coloring of these uh, Keysight oscilloscopes. I think uh, blue is a much better contrast than yellow, but anyway. Um, and here you can also still see our LED is still connected and in is increasing in brightness. Now it's going down and now you can see how it starts when the pulses actually get longer and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And uh, now let's have a coffee break. And after the break, uh, I will, we will go to the analog to digital conversion process and perhaps also try to get a sine wave out because this is something which you can also not see on, on your setup at home. 
Um, we restart at quarter past. your trial yeah sure get rid of this oh everything is recorded okay it doesn't matter blah 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 blah
here we are again and uh, what you can see here is that now the LED is turning up much faster from being off. How comes? What did I do? Well, I just changed the delay within our infinite loop here to 10 milliseconds instead of 100 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds we are increasing now the value um, of the compare register which means that every 10 milliseconds we are stepping the green line one step up between 0 and 255 and uh, this then results in a faster increase in intensity. If you want to have a linear expression of intensity um, to the eye then you will probably not do linear steps as well because our eyes are not more log, uh, sensitive on a logarithmic scale so, than on a linear scale. Um, if we have a look at the oscilloscope again wait a second give you a better view here chewy and we have focus somewhere oh there we have focus um, still now the brightness correction of this or of the camera is is not working so nicely with us but anyway so here is the oscilloscope image now if I change the horizontal time scale and see what the um, green line is doing in this forest of yellow lines i can take away the yellow lines completely then we can actually at an even slower scale see that our time average value is also a staircase now um, so we are increasing our compare value all the time and it takes about well, it should take about two and a half seconds currently with the current settings before we get from 0 to 255 in the compare value and which each step along we are actually getting a new value of our time average output voltage. And uh, this can actually be used to generate not only a staircase function like this one but we could actually use it to create a sine wave function and we could do so by changing the values which we put to the OCR value um, and read them from a table of sine values instead. So I, I'm thinking of the overall timing of these two hours now but le let's do that. So in order to do so I have prepared for you and it's also on Studium a file with sign values. So this is actually MATLAB generated um, open with programmers notepad. blinking here. So this is a list of values between 0 and 255 which respond to a sine wave. So we start at the middle um, which is 128 then it goes up to uh, 255 then it goes down again and uh, passes 128 around here well here is 128 then it goes down all the way to zero and then it goes up again to almost 128 so if we would sketch these values um, can i do this in front of, of the oscilloscope perhaps um, because then i don't have to move the camera uh, so we have the values here. We start at 128 and the maximum is 255. And actually these values 
Yeah, I, I, I know. I know that I, I didn't switch on the camera. Thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't transition to the camera. I, I did this nice graph here, <laughs> though. Um, so this is what the files, the values in the file look like. We start at 128, they go up to 255, down to zero on back up. And uh, if we now put these values into our OCR register, how can we do that? First, we have to take this file. Uh, something happened. Okay, now we. <laughs> I was clicking on the wrong window um, because I see everything double. We take this file here, we copy it, and we put it into the source directory of our project. Now the big question is which of my dozen Explorer windows or so is it? I assume it is this one here. So we go, well, yeah, it's because it's the newest directory. And uh, then we go to source. And here we so far have only our main.c file. And now I paste this sign table file here as well. And it should show up. Yes, it shows up here in our project as well. And now how do we get a sign table like this, an external file into our C code? And for this we can actually use the include which we used up here already. This includes libraries but we can also include any external file and it will just be put into our source code at the corresponding position. What I create here now is a um, a uint18, uh, uint18, uint8 type variable, a global variable, which I call sign table, and it will be an array of values. And I have the brackets here, and within the brackets, I include the external file. I'll include the external file and let's see it should be on this list I can actually start to okay autocomplete doesn't find the file I have to write it out that's because it's a dot text file probably and it doesn't know that I want to import here a dot txt file no one has ever done that before. I, I don't know. Um, this should actually now include this file, which we can add in, edit into this editor as well. So it's 128, comma, 131. So this will then be just a right to a socket. Write what to a socket? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, Samuel. Which data? Our microcontroller doesn't have any socket because we don't have any uh, we don't have any operating system which could handle something like things like pipes or sockets. Last element has next to it. I, I, sorry, I, <laughs> I I'm really not. I, I don't understand what you mean. Sorry. We, we, we will continue with this. We can perhaps handle this later. Um, anyway, so this sign table here is now a, re uh, a record, a field, an array um, containing our sign values. And what I want to do in the main loop here, instead of taking value and putting it into the compare register, I will actually take the value number as an index into my sign table. So I will read the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and so element from the sign table and put it out into the output compare register. I leave the, type, the, the run output running as it does right now. Um, let's see if I did something very stupid because this is live and untested and unscripted. Um, 
and uh, we have at least an error. No such file or directory. Um, what? What? Sign table full 8 bit underscore 256 T. I forgot a T. For some reason, there is a T. Did, did someone. No, I don't know. Ah, yes, the, the, the last element has a comma next to it uh, in the array. That doesn't matter. Um, our compiler ignores this. So this is not the cause of the problem here. Um, the problem was that I wrote the wrong file name and there's still something wrong here. Um, oh! Expected Ah, yes. <laughs> so our sign table doesn't, uh, but, but here it has to have a semicolon. So let's see. The, the correct code is actually in the lab instructions. Um, it's just that uh, I'm messing up here trying to write this freehand. So I had to include a semicolon here to end the statement, of course. And this cannot be in the include file because the include file is only between the brackets. Um, but now we actually have new uh, new code. And let's see what happens if I upload this code into our microcontroller without changing anything else. And uh, just have a look at the oscilloscope um, and see what happens. Now I'm programming. The code is not running. Now our code should start running again and uh, for some reason Zoom is having problems uh, catching up here. But uh, as you can see we can generate a sine wave. And uh, so as you can imagine now you could actually put anything into this array and it will actually output the corresponding time average analog values um, because now we have values which are between 0 volts and 3.3 .3 volts up here or 3 volts roughly and uh, we can generate essentially well not any value we are limited to 256 different values in between here but we can generate analog voltages which with purely digital functions in our microcontroller. And the exact opposite is, of course, to read analog voltages from the outside world and getting them into our microcontroller. And uh, we will do so by using the analog to digital converter of the microcontroller, which is described in very much detail in the data sheet. Um, again, I put up, we don't need the camera or the, we need the camera, but we need it somewhere else. Um, so putting everything into perspective here again, try to focus again. Give me a second. Full screen projector source, no. Escape. No. Escape with you in a second. So that's about focused. I don't know why we now have this yellow background here again. Uh, color balance has been a bit thrown off. The analog to digital functions or the ADC uh, pins are the pins which are in green on this graph here. And for now, I will just use the very first year, which is called ADC0. And uh, we can select any of these green pins to be the input to our analog to digital conversion. 
and uh, that means that we then can read an external analog voltage into a binary number within our microcontroller and uh, so what I will do is I, I take out everything which we have on the breadboard and start up by wiring our potentiometer here so that it can give us analog voltages and we will have a look at these first with a voltmeter which of course by itself is an analog to digital converter probably in the form of a microcontroller so i'll rip off everything which we have here trying not to short circuit anything in the process the safer way to do this is of course to um, disconnect power supply or usb cable when doing a rearrangement like this um, we for now don't need the led or the resistor can i get the resistor out if not it stays i cannot get it out so I'll put the potentiometer here and I already have ground connected to the blue rail. I will now connect 3.3 volts which I find on this pin here. It's labeled plus 3 um, and it's described in the description of the board and connect it to the red rail. Then for the means of visibility, I will not use the, sh the long wires here, but short wires. So I have a little bit shorter wires here, which I can use to connect um, either end, so the two outermost pins of our potentiometer to plus three volts on the one side and ground on the other side like this. And then what you don't have, um, I have again here my little voltmeter module and I'll put it here and I will have to connect this one to power as well. And uh, I will use the same type of short cables. The plus goes here and I had another one. Anyone seeing the short? Yes, here. Short black one is here and now it says zero volts but if i now connect the measure pin of my voltmeter here to the middle pin of the potentiometer then i can go and turn the axis of the potentiometer and i get a voltage which is between zero volts and 3.3 .3 volts how is this done? How does this work? Um, our potentiometer is a resistor. Actually, it is a 10 kilo ohm resistor, which now on one side is connected to zero volts and on the other side is connected to plus 3.3 .3 volts. And then we have a variable, a movable contact along this resistor which will actually probe the potential at a certain point here and uh, ohm's law states that we have one voltage here and we have one voltage here the sum of the two voltages is our 3.3 .3 volts but the different voltages v1 and v2 differ depending on whether our wiper as it's called is closer to this side or closer to this side so this is the signal which we will put into the microcontroller on the pin f0 which is also the pin adc0 so i will connect this one up to this pin here if we are using this as a digital input, it would be a one if we have a high enough voltage on it and it would be zero if we have a low enough voltage on it, but it would not be anything in between. It would be just a single bit. But if we now look into the code which I prepared on Studium, that would be now, let me see which, which, which file are we at now. It should be file five already. 
Um, so file five, I open this with notepad just to copy it into our project control a control c wrong everything wrong again here we are so i turn you over to this view here and i will mark all of the previous code and replace it so um bit irritating with the running numbers there perhaps i hope it's not too irritating for you could i i could hide it for a while i could do it like this um now the numbers are hidden so what do we have here we have the standard definition of our 8 megahertz we have the inclusion of the io.h and of our two usb libraries and uh, delay.h and standard io.h so nothing new here and then comes our init output 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 i don't know what you mean ans um what do we do here? Well, I, I have a DDRD0 support. The D0 pin I defined as an output. Um, it just, ah, okay. Ah, yes, thank you. I, 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 I just saw that something popped up in the chat and I just looked at the last line and didn't see that this was an answer to the previous question. Um, so yes, so the middle pin is the variable wiper, um, which is probing the voltages. For, for us, it's a voltage output between 0 and 3.3 .3 volts. Um, getting back here to the code. Um, so I'm initializing USB interface because we want to see something on the USB port and uh, then I actually have here uh, already the settings for the analog to digital converter. And if I remember it correctly, I think I removed the, the values here for you, but I'm not completely sure. Um, no, I didn't. So let's see where they come from. What, where, what, what are we talking about here? And what, what is this all about? And uh, the data sheet pages for the analog to digital converter i also included into the lab instructions need some space here so this is still the timer 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 here starts the analog to digital converter register description and uh, so the analog to digital converter is controlled by essentially two registers one is called the register at MUX, where MUX stands for multiplexing, and it has these internal bits. We have REFS1 and REFS0, ATLAR, and then we have five bits which are called MUX. Um, so these five bits give us 32 combinations of. Uh, selecting input combinations to our analog to digital converter we have one analog to digital converter but we have a lot of possibilities of what we should be able to connect to this analog to digital converter but let's start with the higher most bits here which are refs1 and refs0 and they select which reference voltage we are using in our analog to digital converter we have the possibility to use our own reference voltage which would be both bits zero we could use vcc which is the 3.3 .3 volt supply voltage of our microcontroller so for us this would be 3.3 .3 volts 
The position 1, 0 is reserved for future use. I don't know. Um, I have no idea um, what they planned originally for this, but it doesn't have, we are not using this. And we have an internal 2.56 volt reference um, which we can select by setting RFS 1 to 1 and RFS 0 to 1. So 2.56 sounds like an odd number, but to us living in the binary world, it's not so odd because uh, 256 is actually 2 to the power of 8. So it is actually, yeah, we would probably get some even binaries out of using this reference voltage. But what we will start with is we will start with this combination here. We will choose the VCC voltage as our reference voltage. Uh, external capacitor means that we actually can filter and stabilize the voltage by connecting an external capacitor to the corresponding pin. And I already have done this. So on the board, itself there is already a capacitor on this pin um, so we, we just it and the thing is this this is 24.9 so so it's chapter 24 section 9 in the description it's the whole chapter 24 gives you all the details about the adc including the the reason and and some reasoning behind it um, so this is just a short summary, which is enough for us to program the thing because this is all we need for now, the, the meaning of the bits. So we want to thus write 0, 1 into these bits. And then we have ADLAR, which is ADC left adjust result. What is this? I didn't speak about this in the lecture, but uh, our microcontroller is an 8-bit microcontroller, as you know, but our ADC is a 10-bit ADC. And so the result of our conversion will be 10 bits, but they are stored in two 8-bit registers. like this. So this is a 16-bit number stored in two 8-bit numbers. And with ADLAR, which stands for left adjust, um, set to zero, our 10 bits would be stored as a number which takes up this space. Um, so this would be our ADC result which is right adjusted. So it, it, the least significant bit of our 10 bits of the ADC result is stored in the least significant bit of this 16-bit number. But Atmel also included the option to actually put the 10 bits instead left adjusted so that our ADC result, that our the highest significant bit of our ADC conversion result of our 10-bit number would be the highest bit of this 16-bit number. Um, we will use this version here for now at least because it's possibly a little bit more logical for us right now. We will read it off as a 16-bit number and it will be a 16-bit number between 0 and 1023. While this here would be between 0 and 65,535. But at steps of, let me see, I think it's steps of 32 or something like this. Or st steps of 64 actually. Um, So we will use this ADLAR should be zero. So we want to have a zero in ADLAR. 
And now we want to select the ADC0 pin. Where do we find this information? We find it in 313. Oh, 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 the table starts down here. I, I was looking for the first parts of this long row here, of this long table. Um, so these are the input channel and gain selections. And we see that it, the table says actually that we should have a max 5 bit even. Here we only have max 4. Actually, max 5 is stored somewhere else, but we don't care. Um, what we want to do is we want to select ADC0 as our input. But just to give you an impression, the table is actually a little bit longer. So, but we want, we, we stick with the very first row of this table. So we are writing zeros into the max bits. How does it look in our code now? In the code, we have at mux, which is the register. And I'm shifting a zero into the position of bit refs one and a one into position of refs zero. This is exa exactly what we said in the beginning. And I said at la the left adjustment bit to zero. And then I wrote a five bit binary number here, which then should correspond to the to the table from the data sheet down here. So this this five bit number is just this these bits which we read off here. Um, in this case, I think it's actually a bit more legible if we do it like this. It, but you could write whatever you want here. Then we have another bit here, ADC SRA. So that must be another bit I said, no, another register. That must be a different register in the data sheet then. And uh, let's see if we find it. And it's here on page 315, the ADC control and status register A. Um, there we have bits like Aden, ADSC, Adate, Adif, Adi, Adps. Um, what do these mean? Well, um, ADC enable, Arden. We want to enable our ADC, so we have to write a 1 into this bit position. And uh, that we keep in mind, so we want a 1 here. ADSC starts a conversion. We don't do this yet. Um, auto trigger enable, we don't care. Interrupt flag and interrupt enable, we don't care. Um, Prescaler bits. Oh, here we have prescalers again. If you remember the lecture uh, or, or had a look at the um, silent, uh, no voice video about the lecture, you saw that a successive approximation ADC converter converts one bit at a time starting with the highest value bit and then it goes through the 10 bits in our case before it has the result of the conversion clear. And uh, if, if anything, I will probably voice over just this part of, of the lecture and uh, that simulation in a separate video. And uh, so here we actually have a list of clock frequency division factors between the CPU frequency and the frequency with which our ADC is converting data. The data sheet states that the conversion frequency should be between 100 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz roughly. And uh, so we want this and we have an 8 megahertz clock frequency from our CPU frequency. So the question is which of these factors is most suitable and it shows that a factor of 64 would actually give us 125 kilohertz of clock frequency for our analog to digital converter which is nicely in this range. The next one here would already be 250 kilohertz which would mean that we are overclocking our 
ADC slightly. It still works at this. It will still work here even. Um, I've tried this with students. We were running the ADC at one megahertz on the ATM on another AT Mega, and it worked flawlessly. Um, but the data sheet says you should stay within this range. Okay, let's stay within this range. So we choose 125, which means that we have to put 110 into these bits. And uh, how does this look in the code? I have a 1 shifted into Aiden, the um, analog digital converter enable bit. And I have uh, 110 for the lowest bits in this register, meaning that we are selecting the FCPU divided by 64 clock divider here. And uh, that's it for the initialization of the analog to digital converter. Now, what else do we have in the main? We I, I define a running 16-bit variable here just to see that something happens on the screen. If nothing else happens, I will write out this number. So we would actually see an increasing number up, up, up here once actually the um, numbers are started ticking again. And uh, here I start the analog to digital conversion by actually switching on the ADSC bit. Remember, 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 remember. I don't know if you remember. I just told you, but I told you so much. I'm gurgling out so much information. Um, so if we look at the data sheet, it is actually this bit which I'm talking about, ADSC. ADSC, ADC start conversion. So look into the data sheet and I mean, this, this bit is really well defined here and, and described by this paragraph. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's like a, a lexicon or an encyclopedia for, for how this thing actually works. So we are starting the conversion here. Let's put a comment here. Start conversion. And it says that this bit is automatically reset. It goes back to zero when the conversion is finished. So we don't have to count the time. The analog to digital converter will tell us when it's done by actually moving back this bit to the zero position. So while it is still not zero, while this bit is still set, we are kept in this loop here. I switch on and off a bit on uh, the GPIO port D. Um, this could be used to actually have a look how long a conversion actually takes, but we don't have the time to do this now. Um, but what we will do instead is actually we write to the USB the value of the register ADC. So back here, this is sprintf again, so the variable text is an 80 byte long text buffer. What I discovered in platform IO yesterday is if I put myself onto a con constant string like this, it tells me that this string is 31 characters long. Um, very nice, you don't have to count the characters, platform IO counts it for you. Um, so I reserved 80 bytes for this text. So um, it will be something like a little bit longer than 31 characters because we will fill up these percent five U with five digits and this one with five digits. So they are three digits now. It will be five digits, it's two extra digits. Anyway, it will print out the number I here in decimal and it will print out the value of the ADC register here. And then we wait a third of a second and then we go through this loop again. And let's see what this code does. Let, let's see if it compiles first. Um, that will be our biggest challenge, perhaps. I don't know. It will warn me again about the FCPU because it's redefined twice. Um, but it, it compiled and we have three kilobytes roughly of code. 
which we now want to get into our microcontroller. I switch you over to the view over here and uh, I think it's a bit out of focus actually. Yeah, no, this is as focused as it gets right now. Um, so I will put our microcontroller into programming mode by double click. And I'll try to find my Avia Judas here and I program the new code. And we will not see anything happening here. But we should actually, if everything would have worked, I would have expected now the USB port to put out the numbers again up here. Um, so I would expect running data here. It doesn't, there is no running data. Um, why not? What is wrong? What is wrong? What went wrong? Did TerraTerm finally hang up on me? I have no idea. I'm printing. I might be stuck in. I shouldn't be. Oh, stupid me. Uh, who, who has seen the problem? Who has seen <laughs> my big mistake in this untested code? <laughs> I have this nice function here in it where I do all the hardware initialization. Well, there's, there shouldn't be anything in this while loop, in, 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 in the one while loop. But the thing, my problem is I never ever go into in it. Um, so I forgot to include the call to in it in the beginning of main. So what does it mean? Well, first our USB interface is never initialized and then I try to write to the USB interface. That's not a good idea. But also our ADC is not switched on and that means it will never finish a conversion. Um, so let's try it again um, with this mistake repaired. I will correct this in the code on Studium um, later. Uh, program and actually I see things already happening here um, and now you see them happening here as well. Uh, so what do we see? Um, well we see numbers and we see the number let, let me see if I can point there yes so up here we have the ADC conversion results as a number, which is currently 306, 309, 307, 306, 308. And up here we see that this is measurement number 112, 114, 118, and so on. So if I now turn the knob of the potentiometer, the numbers, <laughs> the numbers over here change. So now I'm at 3.3 volts and we have the maximum value of 1023, at least sometimes. And if I move the potentiometer to all to the other side, so now we have zero volts input into our ADC, and then we actually get zero out of the ADC conversion as well, over here. So if we are somewhere in the middle by at, at around 1.5 volts, we would expect something in the middle between 0 and 1023, which would actually be 512. Um, so actually the half of 3.3 is 165. Um, so this is 161. <clears throat> and uh, there's now two inaccuracies. Um, I found out that these meters here are not very accurate. Um, so it's it's at best you can trust on these numbers, but the one here is is off. And then of course even our ADC here has some accuracy um, issues. But actually these are very good. The ADCs in the 80 megas are very good. Um, so I would trust this value here much more than I would trust this value here. 
And uh, this is how we can measure analog voltages. And now what we could do is, of course, connect several input voltages to different pins and then switch over by actually choose, changing the value of the ATMUX bit and choose different channels. It even says that we can measure differentials. So the difference between two channels with a certain amplification factor. We will not have a look into this um, for, for now. What I wanted to show you and what I want you to explore with this lab is actually a simple analog to digital conversion with a built-in ADC inside a modern microcontroller. And with this it's 10 o'clock. I'm exhausted. Um, you might be as well. And uh, then I will also prepare now to uh, half an hour from now be standing somewhere outside because it's not raining. Uh, in case someone has a way pass here to actually pick up a box and then afterwards I will eat lunch and afterwards I will have a look into posting uh, alternatives for those of you not in Uppsala. Thank you for today. Thank you for your attention. And so with this also I, I will turn on um, I will return here quarter past just to tell everyone showing up then that there will be no Q&A right now today. Um, but, uh, well, we have means to communicate anyway. And we will we have other scheduled time slots for Q&A on this lab. For now, I want to get as many of you equipped and started with this uh, on your own uh, as possible. Okay. See you later. I stopped the recording here.